Welcome everyone. My name is Julie Baker. Welcome to uh, a webinar today on the newly released California guidelines for outdoor seated live events and performances. We're really happy to have you here and um, excited. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we really could not think of a better way to kick off April as Arts, Culture and Creativity Month in California than to celebrate the return of live events. We are here today to review the newly released guidelines from the California Department of Public Health for outdoor seated live events and performances. The purpose of today's webinar is to provide clarity on what is required and what is recommended by CDPH and Cal OSHA to create safe live events. We urge everyone to read the guidelines carefully. And if any of your questions remain unanswered after this webinar, please reach out to us and we will do our best to get them answered. There will be about 15 minutes today for Q&A, so please use the Q&A function to enter your questions. Again, welcome everyone. My name is Julie Baker. I'm the Executive Director of Californians for the Arts. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm on the land of the Nevada City Rancheria Nisanon, who are currently fighting for federal recognition. Before I introduce our panelists, I wanted to take a brief moment to explain how we got to where we are today. I don't have to remind our sector that it was just over a year ago that the orders came to shut down live events and performances in order to, get, to mitigate the spread of the coronavirus. Many organizations were in the middle of producing and presenting performances and exhibitions, touring acts and major fundraising seasons, not to mention the services provided to youth and after school classes and dance, visual art, literary arts and performance arts rehearsals and so on, our world came to an abrupt stop. 13 months later, as of yesterday, April 1st, guidelines have been released for outdoor seated events. This is the first step in restarting the arts and live events industries in California. We know the capacities are limited, and so it is difficult, if not impossible, to make some of the numbers work, but there's more to come, which you will hear about today. We also know our sector has been devastated by the closures, with 59% of creative workers made unemployed by COVID-19, 69% of businesses, including nonprofits, severely impacted on an estimated $43.1 billion revenue loss for the creative industries in 2020. We need guidelines as they're coming out now, and we're so grateful for that, and we need stimulus investment too. In terms of our work to get here today, we first started communicating with the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development, GoBiz, in June of 2020. In the late summer, we conducted a series of regional conversations across the state and learned that the number one issue for our sector was to get reopening guidelines from the state. After that, Californians for the Arts assembled a 50-plus volunteer task force of industry leaders in multiple disciplines to discuss reopening arts safely and combine efforts to communicate with the state. Over the last several months, a smaller group of industry expert, experts have been meeting regularly with CDPH and GOBIS regarding the release of guidelines. The work has been collaborative and transparent. We truly appreciate the leadership and earnest attention to see our industry reopen and safely get back to business. With all of that said, we hope today will be informative and helpful as you look to plan events. Now, let me introduce our esteemed panelists joining us today. Joining us is Trudy Raimundo, Head of External Affairs for COVID-19 Response for California Department of Public Health, and Brandon Hart, Program Manager for Communications and Strategic Planning from Cal OSHA. To start us off, please welcome Dee Dee Myers, Senior Advisor to Governor Gavin Newsom and Director of the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development, GoBiz. She brings more than three decades of experience in strategic communications, public affairs, corporate governance, and social responsibility in both the public and private sectors. Most recently, she served as Executive Vice President, Worldwide Corporate Communications and Public Affairs for Warner Brothers. She was a member of the company's executive committee and advised the CEO on a wide range of issues. Prior to joining Warner Brothers, Ms. Meyer served as Managing Director of the Glover Park Group. Ms. Meyer served as White House Press Secretary during President Bill Clinton's first term and was the first woman to hold a position. After leaving the White House, she worked as a political analyst, commentator, and writer, as well as a contributing editor to Vanity Fair. She is author of the New York Times bestselling book, Why Women Should Rule the World, and served as a consultant on the Emmy-winning, award-winning drama series, The West Wing. She is no stranger to the creative industries. Dee Dee, welcome, and thanks for being here today. Uh, thank you so much, Julie, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, first of all, we haven't released the guidance quite yet, so you guys are getting a sneak peek. Um, and so uh, uh, it, it will be released later today, uh, and I'm sure you'll see coverage of it over the next few days. So uh, to, just to go back to what Julie said, um, this has been a collaborative process, and we're really grateful to Californians for the Arts uh, for your collaboration and for the insights that you provided as we seek to open the arts industries again in a way that's both safe, but allows the 
critical mission that you guys fill in our uh, cultural life to, 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 re to, to restart. Um, in the interim, I know how hard all of you have worked to try to continue to do what you can uh, to keep the arts community alive, to support it, to keep people safe. We know how hard you'll work going forward to keep your patrons and your performers safe, uh, and, but, the, but to bring back that critical cultural life that we've all missed so much over the last year. I can't believe it's been so long since we've been able to walk into a theater or live performance or enjoy all the things that enrich all of our lives so much. So uh, thank you is, is, is the first thing we want to say. The uh, second thing is Trudy will walk you through the blueprint, um, the updated the guidance for the sector. This is broad guidance. It's the first pass that will give you a, a, some frame for understanding how we're moving forward. Two caveats on that. We'll provide additional more detailed guidance in the uh, let me first say, this guidance will allow you to start having events according to the parameters by April 15th, so two more weeks. Uh, in that time, we will provide additional guidance, specific guidance that might help answer on paper some of the questions that you have. We'll try to answer some of those today as we, as we go forward, but there will be more specific guidance coming. There will also be broader guidance of how do we get past the blueprint, and that will be coming sometime in, in the coming days. Um, it will uh, it will, again, show a path to, you know, with a vaccinated and low infection, right, assuming we continue uh, down this path that we're on, I'm very grateful for and seeing it's not exactly the same in every part of the country and other parts of the world. So we're obviously proceeding cautiously and trying to be safe. But assuming things continue to move in a good direction, we will get eventually to a place where this blueprint will go away. So that guidance is coming. Um, the third point is we'll have more to say about how you can build crowd sizes. The crowd sizes you'll see in the document shortly are still somewhat limited um, because indoor uh, events it, with crowds are still you know, dangerous as we move toward greater vaccination. Yet we, they, there, there is a path to go forward and we will provide an additional path that will allow for greater capacity uh, with vaccinations uh, in the coming days. So with those caveats, let me just say thank you. Look forward to answering your questions and I will turn it over to Trudy to take you through the next steps. Great. Thank you, Didi. And thank you, Julie. And I do just want to thank everybody for allowing me to be here, um, walk you through what we've recently posted for outdoor, uh, uh, live outdoor seated um, events and performances. And then as Didi had mentioned, we can talk um, about what's upcoming um, for indoor seated live performances and events as well. Um, so, but before I get started, you know, I want to acknowledge certainly from the CDPH family, um, how difficult I know this has been for everybody. Um, through this pandemic, you know, we've seen many businesses close, uh, many folks just unable to see friends, family, and really participate in activities that I think had become part of our norm, things that we had enjoyed. And so I just want to acknowledge how incredibly difficult it has been over the past year. Um, but I think, you know, given our case numbers, the trajectory that we are moving, and we all have our fingers crossed that we maintain the same trajectory, um, you know, I think we're really looking forward to kind of this next phase, um, the green phase, and we can talk about that a little bit um, after uh, this presentation. So, but with that, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to actually turn off my video and start doing some screen sharing and show you a little bit of the um, outdoor seated live performance, some major aspects of it, um, cover what the current requirements are, and then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Brandon Hart to talk to you a little more about uh, the ventilation piece. So let me get started here. All right, so can folks see my screen? Yes. Yes, thank you. Always want to make sure. Um, so this is the currently posted um, outdoor seated live events and performances guidance. Um, this guidance went into effect April 1st, so huge yay, perfect timing. Um, so wanted to go over really quickly in the interest of time, because I know you have a lot of questions probably at the end, some major facets that I'd like to point out. Um, this is an area, and we've tried to be really mindful as we develop this guidance to be much more clear about what the requirements are versus what are purely just recommendations. And so I'm going to highlight, I think what's most important to you is what are all of the current requirements um, within this guidance. 
So I'm going to start off with what's applicable across all tiers, because as many of you are probably aware, we are still within our blueprint tier structure. And so um, we have certain capacity limits that go from purple, red, orange, and yellow. Um, but these are things that are required across all of those tiers. I think many of you aren't surprised that we are, you know, Face coverings are mandatory um, throughout the entire process. I think there are probably some questions around this particular uh, category for testing. And so, um, you know, Brandon is uh, available to answer any questions afterwards, but this is really goes to um, what are some of the requirements within Cal OSHA and emergency temporary regs. Um, I do wanna highlight that because this guidance um, also applies to sports, if any of you are interested, that we still have to refer back to all of the appropriate guidance for professional collegiate and other sports. Um, keeping in mind that oftentimes you need to perform indoors, um, we do allow that here, um, but you know, very much so, and this really goes to a lot of our thought process right now, is outdoors is always safer than indoors. So we strongly encourage you to do your rehearsals outdoors if you can. Um, another major aspect of this is that um, we specifically say seated because assigned seating is one of those absolute requirements. And the reason behind that is through assigned seating, it is really one of our I think most important mitigation measures through all of this. Um, it helps to control mixing amongst households and really is just a great measure in terms of reducing any sort of risk uh, to spread of uh, the disease. A um, couple of things around how to establish audience seating um, and then a couple of things. This is an area I wanna highlight um, and this will be really important when I get to the end and talk about venues. Um, this is an area where you need to be mindful of because we wanna make sure um, that you have a process in place to very tightly control um, the concentrations of people going in and out of your particular venue. Um, so covering really quickly what's allowable within the different uh, tier structures, within the purple widespread tier, um, as the name indicates, it's still widespread. So counties that are still in purple, though uh, I have to say, I'm really happy at the fact that we have less and less and fewer and fewer counties that are in purple. Many of them are moving into red. And I think even some of our largest counties are starting to move into orange. Um, so this is a really great sign, but because the transmission community transmission is still widespread, um, hence why you're going to see, you know, venue limitations up to 100 people um, for venues within purple. Um, we are also maintaining this regional spectators um, limitation for any venues um, within counties in purple tier, again, because of uh, the widespread community transmission within that particular community. Um, and another thing that I do want to point out um, is this idea of advanced ticket reservations only. Uh, moving into the red, again, as we start to think about lesser and lesser community transmission within the county, um, we're able to increase our venue capacities up to 20%. Um, we're looking now at being able to provide, um, if you've got suites, um, we again continue to ask that you limit that occupancy to 25%. And the reason being is that even though this is an outdoor um, seated live uh, events and performance guidance, um, typically suites are indoors. And so we really, and indoors for us always poses a much greater risk um, because uh, in an indoor setting, you not just have the risk of droplets, but you have aerosolized um, uh, transmission as well. Um, we're maintaining, this is where we open up the ability for spectators coming in from um, across the state of California. Um, if for those that did not know, um, we recently released new CDPH travel advisory uh, yesterday. So take a look at it um, if you're interested. Um, this is an area where I do wanna point out too that it's um, each of the venues um, really need to be make sure that during a reservation or ticketing process that you let the purchasers know kind of what those requirements are and they will need to do an attestation um, to say that 
the block of seats that they are purchasing for contain no more than the than the one household, um, but that also all of the members of the guest party are actually in-state visitors. Um, this is an area for venue operators that I think you will be interested in is, um, you know, if you do have workers that are participating in the weekly testing program, they will not be counted against an occupancy capacity limit. Um, we have had a question about whether or not we can include vaccinated workers in this as well. Um, and so that will be, that is under uh, consideration. And then we've got some food and drink concessions. Really, they should be delivered to the guests. Um, what this does is it prevents um, crowding um, in concessions and things like that or along the concourse. And again, so that's what we're really trying to avoid. Um, what's unique as we move into the orange tier, which is now moderate, um, we're allowing for venue capacity to go up to 33%. Um, but I wanna highlight this, and this is an area where you probably have a lot of questions about. Um, and it is an area where we are actually um, actively designing um, kind of addendum uh, standards and guidelines to be able to address this. But in the orange tier, this is where we now introduce the idea of being able to expand um, the capacity for your particular venue up to 67% um, if all of the guests show either a negative test or show full proof of vaccination. Um, it maintains the in-state spectators requirement as well. Um, and again, um, please be mindful of any food and drink concessions um, requirements that you've got. Um, within yellow, again, now that we're in a county that's got minimal um, risk of transmission, um, you're allowed to go all the way up to 67% of your full capacity without the requirement around testing or vaccination. Um, this is an area where I know we've gotten a lot of questions, so I really wanna highlight this, is this idea of permissible outdoor venues. And we heard very early on um, that trying to find a fixed and permanent venue can oftentimes be incredibly difficult, um, but also can be incredibly expensive. And so we want to be really mindful and we took um, those concerns into play when we introduce this idea. So yes, you are absolutely open to using a permanent and fixed facility, but I wanna point out this big or. Um, you are also able to use um, what we're calling a temporary outdoor facility. Um, and really it can be, you know, something that you establish then are able to establish in a park, um, in a parking lot. So it does not have to be a fixed and permanent facility so long as you know, you are maintaining all of the requirements to establish, you know, seat assignments, uh, making sure that it follows um, our current definitions around what are acceptable temporary structures. And if you wanna take a look, there is current CDPH guidance around that. Um, the one thing I do want to point out is um, we're really clear in terms of what that facility needs to look like. Um, it should either be open to the sky or at least 50% of the total perimeter being open. And the reason for this is we really want to maintain the safety of an outdoor setting. Um, and so if you try to close it off with some temporary walls, um, what you've now created is an indoor setting. So please be really mindful. Outdoor is always gonna be safer because really what it does is allows for natural airflow and ventilation, which is what always makes an outdoor setting infinitely safer than an indoor setting. Um, and then just a couple of other things that, you know, we want to be mindful of. I won't read these for you. Um, you know, please, um, as Julie said, um, take the time to really go through this guidance. Um, it's got some really, great additional information beyond the requirements, um, but I do want to make sure everybody gets an opportunity to read through all of the requirements as well. Um, and then there are additional requirements that I won't go through again around required use of face coverings, worker prevention programs, outbreak and testing, um, some individual control measures, ventilation, which my colleague Brandon will cover um, after I'm done here, cleaning and disinfecting, and then the only other thing I wanted to highlight is 
um, in previous guidance, I think it was difficult to discern um, when what the requirements are versus what were the recommendations. So what we've tried to do is actually very clearly identify what are additional recommendations um, that we have for the venue. And even though the recommendations, I still would encourage you to read them. They've got some really great ideas and strategies around entry and security. We've got some really great ideas on how you can continue to protect your performers. Um, especially musical performers. So we've got some really great strategies and ideas that I would encourage you to take a look at. Rehearsals, even travel. You know, how do you maintain the safety of um, not just the performers, but perhaps your own crew um, as you travel from venue to venue potentially. Um, around casting and auditions, um, construction mills and set designs, um, scenery, costume, hair, makeup. So we really tried to, to create a comprehensive all-encompassing guidance um, that allows um, for us to at least share some best practices and some, some strategies uh, with the industry. So that is my coverage of, I think, what are the major aspects of this guidance. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing now and turn it over to Brandon from Cal OSHA um, to start sharing around ventilation. Hi, thank you, Trudy. And, and thank you everyone for joining today's uh, webinar presentation. So as Trudy mentioned, um, you know, my responsibility at Cal OSHA is, is to oversee the outreach and communication. So I'll be sharing um, information about the ventilation requirements that we've included in, in the statewide reopening guidance um, specific to this particular uh, guidance itself. So um, as you've been made aware, uh, you know, from Trudy, we do have an emergency temporary standard um, that includes um, several provisions and obligations um, that was passed uh, on November 30th, uh, 2020. And this ultimately to prevent employee exposure to COVID-19 in California's workplaces. So um, within the ETS, uh, employers um, who do have indoor settings, um, there are some requirements related to ventilation and CDPH has worked with Cal OSHA on developing guidance, which was posted um, not only on Cal OSHA's website, but also on CDPH's. And the requirements um, of that particular guidance is for indoor locations. So some of these outdoor venues that do have indoor locations, such as those that, um, that are, have these suites or locations where, where employees will be working indoors to prepare um, food for guests, um, there are certain requirements for the ventilation. So ultimately the employers or the venue operators have to evaluate on how to maximize uh, the quantity of, of, of outdoor air and whether it is possible to increase filtration efficiency to the highest level um, compatible with the existing ventilation system. Um, for buildings with me mechanical and natural ventilation or both, employers must maximize the quantity of outside air provided to the extent feasible. Um, so what this basically means is try to open up you know, windows, um, ensure that the, that the ventilation system um, allow for that filtration um, with, without posing an additional hazard to employees such as excessive heat or cold or during wildfire season when we have um, potential particulate matter in the air that we have to protect workers um, from. So um, also covered in the ETS um, are requirements um, when there's an outbreak um, that may occur within that particular um, unit or area where employees work. So um, employers are also required to implement changes to reduce the transmission of COVID-19 based on what they find or what they learn from their investigation um, and consider moving some of those tasks outdoors or having them performed um, in an area where there's improved air filtration or increased physical distancing as much as possible. Um, also, uh, employers should also take uh, the following actions in buildings or structures with mechanical ventilation, employers um, shall filter recirculated air with minimum efficiency reporting value of 13 or higher. So essentially they're to evaluate their system and increase that filtration as much as possible to ensure that um, it, you know, if there's a COVID-19 outbreak within that area, they're able to protect those employees um, as much as possible uh, to prevent the spread. So those, those particular uh, obligations and requirements are outlined in the emergency temporary standards and they're also included in the statewide reopening guidance um, you know, for, uh, for, for venues and venue operators to reference. 
Thank you, Trudy. Uh, thank you, Brandon. Thanks, Trudy. And thank you, Didi. I think if everyone wants to, um, Didi, Trudy, if you want to go ahead and put on your uh, cameras again, we will go ahead and start to get already to the Q&A, which is great. We have a half an hour to get through a lot of questions. Just to reiterate, again, I just want to be really, really clear. Today, what was shared with you are the outdoor seated uh, guidelines for live events and performances that are currently available and started yesterday. So you can start doing these performances. Secondly, I want to be very clear that it is not just permanent venues because this has been misreported in several articles. And so please look at the big capitalized or that Trudy pointed out and make sure that you so that you were very, very clear on that. Third, I wanted to just state that what is coming out later today will be in the blueprint. Um, the beginning of uh, what will be allowable for out uh, indoor. Uh, um, guidelines for live events and then um, and those will be uh, available starting um, to activate starting April 15th um, correct Trudy and correct. Uh, all right and then exciting on the on the you know in in the future soon especially if we all get vaccinated uh, will be uh, the green tier and uh, hopefully to a place where we can really start to see our capacities increase um, and and get back to business so um, I just want to make sure I've re reiterated all of that correctly. Um, and if that's the case, I'm going to go ahead and start um, asking you guys some questions. That, some of these we received prior, and then some of these are in the Q&A. So I'm going to go ahead um, with the first one. If the performers at an event are not the producer's regular employees who work a schedule, um, what are the testing requirements for the performers prior to the event? Julie, I'm happy to take that question. So this largely depends on whether the performers will be wearing face coverings and physically distanced at least six feet from others. Um, if they cannot wear face coverings and maintain the six feet physical distance requirements, then they would fall under the mandatory testing requirements that are found under the emergency temporary standards. Thanks, Brandon. I also saw that somebody said, um, asked a question, can performers come from out of town? Because we know we have the restrictions on the audiences um, in some of the tiers um, in state, et cetera, but can performers come from out of town? So performers, when you say out of town from other states? Uh, I'm sorry, out of state? Yeah. And, and that's when I would point you to the current um, updated CDPH travel advisory. Um, it talks a little bit about if you are coming into town, um, you know, what the requirements are around quarantining and things like that. So um, if you are coming in from out of state or even out of country, um, the travel advisory uh, will provide that information. Okay, yeah, because as you know, so many um, of uh, people in the industry do touring acts or bringing mm -hmm. in performers from other states yes. um, and other countries. Does the maximum capacity of a venue include ushers, servers, and other venue employees? Yes, so the maximum capacity would include all of those workers um, and other support staff for the venue. Um, I do want to point out, though, that you know, there is a caveat in the guidance that says for those workers that are participating in that regular weekly worker testing program, um, that they do not count against the capacity limit. Um, and we are also thinking about, um, a question had come up previously, um, whether that could include workers who are vaccinated as well. Um, and so we are taking that into consideration. Okay, so that answers, what if all performers have been vaccinated? Do they still have to get twice weekly testing if they're unmasked and not six feet apart, or maybe they mean masked and not six feet apart. So what we are working on currently, um, and this is actually in conjunction with Cal OSHA, um, is further guidance on how to treat um, fully vaccinated performers um, and workers, um, just because you know we want to make sure that there are still worker protections um, that are maintained, and so I think that's incredibly important. Um, but I know there's a lot of questions as to you know what what do you do with either a fully vaccinated audience or a fully vaccinated workforce, um, and so those kinds of things will be coming out in subsequent guidance. Excellent. We look forward to receiving those and sharing those as well. 
Um, there's some questions around no public, I mean, it says in recommendations, no public hugging or handshakes. And as this person pointed out, music and other festivals and uh, graduations or celebrations, natural human mm -hmm. physical expression by the attendees of some are and not limited to you know, dancing, singing. Does the new guideline prohibit this even if the people doing it are in their pod, their bubble or their family? Um, so I think you had noted that it's a recommendation. Um, and the reason we do that is really because um, really trying to protect, I mean, we would never um, say that folks within their own household couldn't hug or, you know, handshake, things like that. I mean, because you're within your household. Um, we really maintain that recommendation just because there's always still the risk of transmission, you know, from other households. So, um, but it is a recommendation. Um, you know, we realize and we recognize that many of the things that may be covered here are celebratory um, in nature, but, you know, from a public health standpoint, I have to just, you know, continue to say, um, you know, uh, maintaining that, that level of protection within your household is really important. Um, it's one of our best mitigation strategies um, is being able to maintain that physical distancing. Um, between other households, just because you also don't know um, if the other household is fully vaccinated, uh, if they've been tested, those kinds of things. So um, just, you know, always be mindful of the risk. And uh, one thing that I didn't point out and maybe is worth saying now is, you know, as we go through some of these guidance and we, we start to reopen some of these sectors, and I'm really happy that we're actually open, uh, you know, able to open some of those uh, other sectors is that this is not the time though to start letting our guard down. Um, and so we want to do this. We want to get the economy moving. Um, we want to get this industry moving again because it is so critical from even just a social and emotional standpoint, um, but it's not time to put our guard down. So there are some really just important mitigation measures from a public health standpoint um, that are always going to be important, probably even beyond um, when we even move into the green phase. So not the time to let our guard down. Thank you, Trudy, for those wise words. And um, also, I think it's really important when you read the, uh, the guidelines to recognize what are recommendations mm -hmm. and what are uh, things that are, that are necessary to do in order to put on your event. Um, uh, so here's a question. Who is responsible to enforce that only California residents are attending have a negative test or vaccine? And is that a report submitted to the local or state government? Um, so that will be the venue operator um, because the participants, the observers, the spectators um, will need to attest to those things that they're in-state visitors, um, but then will also have to show either proof of negative test or proof of vaccination. Um, we don't ask you to collect that information and report it back to the state, however. Thank you. Um, will attendees to outdoor events be contact traced or listed as attended by the venue or local state government? Similar sort of. Yeah, I mean, if, you know, it's discovered that, you know, we have a positive case um, and, you know, we go through our normal contact tracing process, um, you know, we're going to have to go through and we'll probably connect with the venue operator to kind of figure out, especially if, you know, we can identify that they may have been at a venue and things like that. So, um, you know, contact tracing is a core public health function. And so if something gets traced back, and that's why some of these requirements are really important because it really just helps to continue to keep um, the spectators as well as the entire workforce safe. Excellent. And I would just uh, add to that, that uh, we, people, because because tickets are mostly going to be available only online, right? That mm -hmm. the, the vendors will be able to, venues will be able to collect that information. If at, yes. so, when, when we move into a into a phase where, you can buy a ticket at the door and use cash, things mm -hmm. like that. Then you will have to just uh, record somebody's name and a contact information in case there is an outbreak. Thank you. Um, I think this is something that we've seen a couple of times come up in the questions that have um, come over. To the extent that the allowable percentages of capacity for live performance um, under each of the tiers uh, may not be achievable while also maintaining six feet of distance on all sides of household groups, which of the two standards is the prevailing one? Um, so it is right now, um, you have a capacity limit for the entire venue um, and that capacity limit um, includes physical distancing between the separate households. So it's not, you can just do physical distancing and then kind of ignore the capacity limit. 
um, within that 67%, um, for example, you still have to maintain the physical distancing. Um, one of the things though that I think all of you will be happy to hear is that we are actively working on kind of an addendum um, to all of this guidance. So we're, we are planning to follow up with additional information on how we can start to think about kind of an all vaccinated section um, and then, you know, just an all tested section. Because one of the things that we've definitely heard is that, you know, maintaining the six feet of physical distancing between households, um, it's nearly impossible then for a venue to get up to the 67%. So acknowledging and recognizing that um, we are working on, in fact, we've started working on some drafts where, um, you know, you can think about then ultimately maybe creating an entire section that would be just fully vaccinated. So that wouldn't then have to have the physical distancing and so, you know, you could act theoretically almost um, meet 100% of like that 50%. And then another section where we would maintain physical distancing. But those are all things that we are, we are definitely working on. Um, but there are some things that we would have to consider within that, that construct. Um, you know, how do, how do you address the worker um, and performer population within all of those things? So, um, but we are working on trying to develop some additional uh, guidelines and guidance um, related to that, because we do want to make sure that you are able to take advantage of the 67%. And so how do we help you get to that point? Trudy, on top of that question, I think there's a number of people who've asked, is there, do you anticipate that there might be a time where the six feet could be reduced, let's say to three feet, like we've seen in schools? Um, we're still looking at that. I know the th CDC put out um, the three feet physical distancing. Again, that was very specific for K through 12. Um, you know, we're constantly looking at the science around all of these things, um, you know, but so, you know, I'd love to say that, yes, you know, four weeks from now, we're going to get there. Um, we're still reviewing all of the science related to that. I think it was, you know, with schools, um, you know, it's a younger population. And I think we've always said with definitely with the younger population, um, they're not um, great transmitters of the disease. Um, and so I think that probably is one of the biggest reasons why um, the CDC elected to go to three feet as a recommendation for schools, um, not so much for an adult population, but, but we are definitely, you know, watching all of the science. We so appreciate that again, because I know I just, I want to reiterate how collaborative the process has been and how much you've really been listening to the industry experts and understanding our sector. So thank you for that. Speaking of um, uh, younger uh, students, um, a question came in around uh, the CDPH stated that band, choir and drama were considered low contact, but gave no guidelines. Dance has not been addressed on, only as PE. Do you, will there be guidelines for that coming? I know it's not specific to what we talk, we're necessarily talking about. Yeah. I just wanted to lift that up because that, that did come in a couple of times. Yeah, and, and that's actually within our youth sports guidance. And so we are kind of re-looking at all of these, things, especially in light of now having this outdoor seated and soon to be indoor seated live performance. Like how do we, you know, make sure that the two mesh? So we are looking at that. Oops, sorry. This has come up a number, hit that unmute button, um, a number of different ways, which is, you know, what is the best way to determine maximum capacity in a parking lot or a park or a plaza, for example? So, you know, that, that there's some people are starting to really, it's great. It's not, we've clarified, it's not just permanent mm -hmm. fixed venues, but how do you do this in determining what could be the full capacity then? Yeah, for a venue that doesn't necessarily have a quote unquote fire capacity limit or, or through designer um, operations. Um, let us take that back, um, you know, uh, and work through what that might look like. And it, it might be just, a, you know, an addendum or a separate set of clarification or guidance on how to do that. Because we realize it's hard to say, you know, it's hard to say, yes, you can have a temporary outdoor structure like in a park, but then how do you establish a capacity limit for the park? So, but let us take that back. Unless Didi, you've got, you know, <laughs> some a wealth of industry knowledge to help lend to this. <laughs> um, I, we, we, and we will take it back and, and provide a little extra cl cl clarification. Um, the question has come to us in, in another form, mm -hmm. which is if we set it up to meet the distancing guidelines, both six feet between households 
and 12 feet be between the performers, can we build it that way uh, with the necessary perimeter? And the answer was yes. So I think as long as you meet all the other considerations of again, distancing, masking, perimeter, distance between performers, um, yeah. that can determine the capacity in a venue that doesn't have a capacity limit. That makes sense, thank you. I think this is um, an important question to answer. I think I know the answer, but, I, but I'm gonna leave it to you guys. Our performances are free and in a commercial plaza, this is the question. Seating is anywhere on the commercial plaza that you can listen and hear the performance. Also people sit on a lawn directly in front of the section of the plaza that is set for perform performance area. We are in orange tier. Do I understand that as long as we can attest that attendees are vaccinated and are from in state, there is no need to close off the access access to this commercial plaza, which is open? Well, I, I think the one thing that, you know, I want to point out in this guidance is this word seated. So that's, you know, that's a very important aspect of the guidance is that the consideration about being seated, as well as the requirements around having assigned seating. So if I'm understanding the question directly, it's a little more open, um, uh, where you know, folks um, may just kind of choose to, you know, where they sit and things like that. Um, this guidance really applies to, you know, where you can establish very clearly demarcated assigned seating with rows um, and those kinds of things. So I think we would have to consider then. And, and one of the things that we have, I told um, other folks that have asked this is there's nothing prohibiting you um, maybe from, you know, working obviously with the, um, the venue is, can you establish seating there, temporary seating there, you know, could you put up seats um, that then clearly demarcate, you know, an area, you know, set it up by rows, things like that, so that then you meet the definition of quote unquote assigned seating and then can use this guidance um, as a result. But that is the one thing I do want to point out is that that restriction around the assigned seating because it's the that's ability right. co to control the mixing that's yeah. important. So to add to what Trudy just said, um, the uh, first of all, if, if you had people coming and going, you couldn't con uh, confirm that they had been vaccinated, right? You, you have to have some kind of a established perimeter. Um, so that would be a, another barrier to an event like that. And I think if I'm understanding it right, it's sort of a plaza and people are coming and going that would really fall under the uh, gatherings category yeah. that we're gonna release in a little while. Um, and those have um, uh, stricter capacity limits. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I happen to know who the person is and, and it's in it's a plaza in, in Los Angeles where they do free events. And so I think they're just trying to establish I think what you were saying, if I'm if I'm understanding the guidelines correctly as well, which is that they would have to have a perimeter, they would have to ticket. Um, even if it's a free mm -hmm. ticket, you would have to have specific seating areas mm -hmm. um, and as, with six feet distance between the pods. Mm -hmm. um, and that would, and it would have to be limited to capacity based on whatever tier you're in, total mm -hmm. capacity based on the entire square footage of the space that would be designated, yeah. probably with a fire marshal would have to make a determination. Yeah. And then okay. they would have to set up some sort of system to do kind of advanced reservation. So, um, right. you know, the other thing that we're really trying to limit is kind of day of, um, right. just because then, you know, it's really difficult from a contact tracing perspective um, to be able to collect that information where an advance reservation, you, you're able to have that information readily available. But what we also then want to discourage is like congregating at the event because people are trying to buy their tickets at the event. So we're really, you know, it's difficult to um, manage any sort of ing egress, ingress into, you know, a site um, if folks are just kind of showing up during the, the day of the event. Um, and purchasing their tickets then. So, so be mindful of that requirement as well. And also, of course, be mindful that hopefully these are just temporary, as you were saying, Trudy, and we're continuing towards um, looser tiers and, and maybe even past tiers if everyone continues to get vaccinated and we get to a place where but, yeah. um, we're really controlling the spread. So, yeah. But, um, but again, to Didi's point, we are putting out gathering guidance soon. Um, and those gathering limitations are actually going to be part of our the blueprint sector update we post this afternoon. 
Great. So and for those very, for those kind of open events, um, you'll be able to see what those capacity limits are by tier this Terrific. afternoon. Terrific. And we will, uh, for everyone who registered for this, uh, we will shoot, shoot those links over to everyone, as well as the recording of this, so you can share that with people. Um, oh, I just saw a question and went away. Okay, I, our venue, it says, is within a California state park and our use is subject to a special event permit. To my knowledge, the parks will not issue a permit until the entire state is in yellow tier. Is that still applicable? I think that's a state park question. Well, I'll take that back. Um, I'll note that and, and talk to um, the state park because that would be a state park requirement. Okay. Um, does county guidance, this is, I think someone, this is important for people to understand, supersede the state guidance, even if perhaps less restrictive? So local jurisdictions always have the authority to um, institute um, more restrictive guidance from the state. Um, that's absolutely within their authority to be able to do that. Um, it is not so to be less restrictive um, than the state. So, so in other words, people who are putting on live events should familiarize themselves with the state guidelines as yes. um, we've linked in the chat um, that are also available on our website and on uh, covid19ca.gov's website under industry guidance. Um, and, and then also work with your local County yes. public health departments on producing your uh, events uh, specifically in your guidelines and your maps and your instructions for that particular event. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Um, just again, okay, so uh, can you please confirm that seating pods can be comprised of up to three households and that they have not issued a cap limit number of people per pod, meaning that an outdoor seating pod could have 10 people if they are from three households and form a group together to reserve their pod for an outdoor performance? So we still maintain the requirement around six feet of physical distancing between households. So, and even when you make your reservation, you have to attest that it's a single household that you're making the reservations for. So um, we recognize, you know, a lot of folks have, have um, uh, brought to our attention this idea of pods. It, it's the same way that, that we're considering like, you know, a fully vaccinated section. Folks have asked, you know, can we have a fully vaccinated pod? Um, the way it stands right now though, is that you do have to maintain that six feet of physical distancing between different households. Got it. So it's really not pods, it's just households yes. uh, right now. Got it. Yes. Okay, so that's, I think, important for people to understand because I see a lot of questions around that. Um, Okay, sorry, it, sometimes it moves and I, I was right on a question and then the whole <laughs> thing moves. I'm like, where am I? Um, uh, let's see. Uh, if a museum were to hold a lecture outdoors, do they have to follow the same guidelines released for outdoor performances or the industry specific guidelines for museums within the blueprint for the safer economy? So if they are, if they're holding a performance? A lecture, a lecture, lecture. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, as long as they follow all of the guidance, because the, the museum guidance is specific to what happens within the walls of the museum. Um, if they hold something outdoors that would constitute having an audience um, and some sort of performer or speaker or something to that effect, then they should be following this uh, outdoor seated live performance guidance. Well, here's a very specific question, but I know for all those of us who do outdoor events, this becomes important. What about porta potties? Are they allowed? <laughs> Um, yeah, I would, I would think so, and I hope so. I mean, obviously, just making sure, because it's just, I think, a standard for um, hygiene, because hygiene is such an important facet um, and such an important mitigation measure. So just make sure there's, there's they stay clean and that, um, yeah, you've got enough soap, enough water for, for everybody. So, okay, great. Um, I mean, it's, it's actually very, it's, that's definitely something that those of us who do events has, has to consider. Um, so I just, again, I wanna be really clear because I'm seeing a lot of questions about this. People seem to think that it's th up to three households that are in social bubbles because I think that's what you have for private gatherings if you're fully vaccinated. Can you just clarify that? Because I keep seeing this, that people seem to think that there's something about three households. But what we're saying right now is that seating is one household and then at six feet distance to the next 
Correct. What they may be, um, the current gathering guidance um, has a limitation for three households. Um, but even if you look at the gathering guidance, it says those three households need to maintain physical distancing. That's the, that to me is the, I don't think I can say that enough. That's probably the most important part is uh, the idea that you have to maintain physical distancing um, across different households. And, and so in terms of, I may, and maybe you don't want to get too prescriptive or specific on, on what you what you see as seeding. <laughs> um, so, cause I know that, you know, if you're in a designated demarcated area on a ground, um, in an area is seeding always going to be a chair or do you not want to get that prescriptive? Versus? Versus a blanket, versus a, a picnic bench, versus a bring your own chair. I mean, I think, you know, we try to be really clear about having the assigned seating for a reason. Um, again, to be able to just control, you know, mixing um, and make sure that folks, you know, that you're maintaining the ability to have to establish six feet of physical distancing. So um, we'll take that back to the group. I mean, I, I you know, we never want to get too prescriptive, but you know, the, the intent behind the assigned seating is again, to control the mixing, um, to be able to um, establish, you know, clear areas where you can separate households um, from other households. So that, that is truly the intent behind um, that requirement. And I think a lot of people who do outdoor events as I've produced them myself, you know, you do have, you could potentially look at having a, a, a designated area within that area, you know, outlined, ticketed, assigned, but you don't provide the actual seat. Mm -hmm. That would be something I think we would love for you to bring back okay. is what I'm seeing in all of these questions. Okay. Um, there's a sort of specific question right now, if you go under live theater, it still says closed. Will that be updated on the COVID-19ca.gov website under counties? So it starts to say outdoor, you know, sea guidance. It's just- Yeah, and, and that's probably the, uh, assumption that it's indoor, um, which unfortunately they are right now until we get uh, the indoor seated live performance out and it becomes effective uh, April 15th. So I think the assumption is that um, that applies to indoor theater. Got it. Okay. Um, if a ticketed indoor performance is held in a church, which guidelines prevail? Um, so uh, ultimately, so is it within a worship setting? or outdoors. I think, uh, I, think it, I think they don't say specific, it says indoor performance in a church. Um, um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so there are very specific guidelines um, already established within, if you take a look at that same CA COVID site, um, there's some specific, specific guidelines um, around houses of worship. So I would refer to those very specific guidelines for houses of worship in terms of what can happen indoors. Um, but definitely if something happens outdoors, um, they should follow the outdoor seated live performance. Okay. Um, I think I'm now seeing in the questions why there's some confusion around the three households that you might wanna just take a, another look at is because of the suites. It says in the okay. suite that you can have up to three households. So I think that people are saying, well then if we designate an area outside and those people see themselves as a you know the three households could they not be seated together as a pod okay um we're still maintaining though that those have to follow the physical distancing until we get to that place you know where we can establish those additional kind of guidelines or guidance around you know what would be the implication if um, you could have a suite of just fully vaccinated individuals, you know, what would be the implication of that, and um, is there ability to to do something other than? But until we get to that point of getting that guidance developed and stood up, even within the suites, um, they still have to maintain the physical distancing. Okay. Um, there's, and we only have three minutes left. I know everybody has um, <laughs> noon meetings. Uh, I, I I know these go really fast. We have. 
85 questions, um, which I, we certainly couldn't get to all. Wow. Okay. What, what, but I, but again, you know, because we work so now in, you know, mm -hmm. closely with your offices, what we will do um, is make sure that we gather all of these, aggregate this, we will actually create a Google form for mm -hmm. people who didn't even get to ask their questions. Maybe they haven't read the guidelines yet. They want to read them. Then they have questions after that. And we will aggregate these questions and try, try, try to form an FAQs with your offices as well, as much as possible, so that we can address these things um, ongoing. Mm -hmm. And um, I just in the last couple of minutes, just again, maybe it would be helpful to reiterate just sort of what's coming um, soon, what we have right now, what we think is coming soon, and give people that really wonderful sense of hope uh, that the, for the light at the end of the tunnel here. Yeah, so, and, and you know, I probably should have prefaced um, before I start my presentation, you know, these guidelines, again, are intended to be kind of short term. Um, you know, we really wanted to get something out to the industry um, to get you operational. Um, and so, and to get you moving. And so they really are intended to be at this bridge um, until we get to what we're calling the green phase. And the green phase really is the, the idea behind the green phase is where, you know, we actually move out of this blueprint and move out of these tier structures um, and return to normal operations for all of the industries. Um, I, will, I will say though, you know, with a caveat that I think there's still going to be additional state guidelines related to it. Like I think masking is always going to be important, you know, irrespective, you know, that's going to be a standard, I think for a while. Um, but, you know, again, you know, just to reiterate, there is a light at the end of this tunnel. So us introducing these, these guidance documents, um, again, is to get you up and running, to get you operational, um, and maybe even just give you a chance to start to operationalize some of the some of the things that probably will move into the future, whether it's, you know, going through that process to make sure you have a system in place to identify vaccination or testing, uh, those kinds of things. So, but the green phase is coming um, and the green phase is really intended to move us out of this kind of blueprint tier structure. Um, and it's gonna look at some broader guidelines um, at the state level that where we wanna just continue to be able to um, employ some of these um, mitigation strategies without necessarily giving you, you know, these hard caps um, that I know many of you are struggling with. And, you know, the other thing I do wanna just remind everybody is this afternoon, we're gonna get out um, an updated blueprint sector chart. It will have in there um, the new uh, capacity limits for gathering, um, for private events, as well as indoor seated live performance and events. So take a look at that. All of those things will have an effective date of April 15th. Terrific. Well, I just wanna thank you, Trudy, Dee Dee, Brandon, for, um, for your collaborative work with the industry to get these guidelines going. Um, I know there's a lot more questions. We'll do our best to respond to those um, afterwards uh, via email and such. Um, so stay tuned uh, for more information that's coming out. Um, very exciting. We do see the light at the end of the tunnel. So thank you. Any final comments from the from the group? Um, thank you, Julie, for bringing yes. everybody together. And um, uh, we'll continue to work with you all to um, answer questions and provide guidance, as Trudy said, uh, to allow you to move forward. Thank so. you so much. And uh, we look forward to that. And thanks to everyone for attending today. And please read the guidelines, get yourself informed, <laughs> and then ask us questions. And we'll be happy to respond um, as quickly as possible. Stay safe out there. Get your vaccines. And uh, we'll vaccines. see you at a soon. Yes. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.